Well, once again, my thanks for your usual warm welcome to Falkirk. I'm going to speak tonight, as has been said, on a historical topic. And as you all know, Henry Ford once said that history is bunk. And that's a very commonly held view, even, I would confess, in church circles and indeed also in free church circles. And I suppose that one can see why, because it is in many ways a backward-looking subject and we may ask with some degree of consternation what's the value of looking at these age-old things and what can we learn from an age that differs so much from our own as, for example, it is John Knox's 16th century. Now, there is a difficulty here because one may hold that history is not bunk and yet have to admit that we learn little from history. But I think that in fact both of those things are true. We repeat often all the errors of the past and we often fail to learn its lessons. But it seems to me that history is validated by the Bible itself as a major resource for the Church of Jesus Christ because a huge proportion of God's Word is taken up with the story of God's people. Much of the Bible is history. And it can be said, of course, that history itself is his story, is God's story in a general way. And more profoundly, of course, the Gospels tell us God's story in terms of the life of his own son during his time here on earth. We have in the Old Testament an account over many centuries of the exigencies and experiences of God's Old Testament people, Israel. We have in the New Testament the story of Christ and the Gospels, and of the early church in the book of Acts. And within those histories, there is a very large element of biography. The great men who, uh, in many ways, molded developments and initiated decisive new beginnings. Now, there are different views of what history is, and I don't hold now that men as such make history. I might once have been much of that view, but I think that to a large extent events make men rather than men make events. And this week itself we meet in the solemn shadow of the death of a first minister. And that is an event for which none of us had made any provision. There's certainly not within such a short time scale. And that event, along with the current Middle Eastern unrest, will really unlock a sequence of events that none of us would have been able to foresee. And John Knox, in many ways, illustrates this principle of the interaction between men and events. Events made him as much as he himself made events. Now, Knox is remarkable, first of all, and I'll cover this fairly quickly, for three rather peculiar reasons. It's remarkable to begin with because he is so much hated. There is no figure in our Scottish history who has been so demonized as this little man from Haddington. And sometimes the venom is, for me personally, almost unbearable. I uh, read recently the poet Edward Muir's life of John Knox. And Edward Muir is a poet of enormous distinction, a poet who went through, as it happens, several Christian conversions and I suppose a several is a tragic word. He knows what the Christian faith is. And yet often I had to put this book down 
because it was so virulent and it was so irrational in its accusations against our great reformer, uh, who was seen as a paranoid Philistine bigot and whose charge was laid the blame for all of the malaises of our Scottish society. Noxious, particularly obnoxious to Scotland's artistic community, to whom architecture and drama and music mattered, of course, far more than to the concerns of our immortal souls. But although there is in the human breast a natural aversion to the Christian faith simply as such, for some reason, Knox attracts from men like Robert Burns and David Hume, Edwin Muir, men of that kind, a hatred that really is beyond rationality and beyond description. Secondly, it is a remarkable fact that there is great uncertainty as to the time and place of Knox's birth. We are fairly certain that Knox came from East Lothian, from Haddington possibly, or from the Ormiston area of that part of the country. And it is in many ways uh, an interesting observation to visit that part of the world today, as I visited it often some months ago, to visit uh, an old lady who was dying, and to look upon that world as it is now with its almost total lack of awareness of our Presbyterian heritage and to tell oneself that here, in a way, is where it all began with the birth of this man, John Knox. But although the place is relatively uncertain, the uncertainty of Knox's date of birth is quite remarkable. Thomas McCree and many others, down in fact to Edwin Muir, have argued that he was born in 1505. But most modern scholars put Knox's date of birth as Kirka 1515, between 1513 and 1515. And what I find remarkable is that here is somebody on whom Scotland's story turns as on a pivot, whose origins are yet marked by such obscurity. It would be bad enough not to know the exact day that he was born, but not to know within a decade the date of his birth. That, I think, is a kind of commentary on the kenosis, the self-denial that Knox himself practiced. He did not attract attention to himself, to his own background or his own history and origins. And that's why that uncertainty remains. Now, one reason why people find it hard to accept the later date is that if Knox was born in 1515, he was only 58 years of age when he died, younger by five years than Donald Dewar. And what is remarkable there is that for many years previously, those who saw Knox and described him commented on his fragility as a very old man. And before his death in 1570, two years before he died, Knox suffered a stroke. That didn't keep him from preaching. But there is no doubt that Knox's sufferings and Knox's labors did wear him out prematurely. Now, I hesitate to invite comparisons with my own appearance, but I am now slightly older than Knox was when Knox died. Whether I'm that worn out is best of yourselves to judge. But he certainly was physically decrepit some years before he died at this comparatively early age. It's also remarkable that we know so little of John Knox's precise burial place. He was himself anxious, as John Calvin was, that there should be no risk of his place of interment becoming some kind of a shrine. And he was buried 
in some corner of the kirkyard of St. Giles Church in Edinburgh, somewhere in the modern Parliament Square. Um, there used to be a brass plaque in the roadway there with the letters JC, the Latin form of Knox's name. I don't know if that plate is still there, but it bore in itself no precise relation to the actual place of interment. Knox was probably buried in the Isle of St. Giles, but that Isle perhaps no longer exists. It was at one time part of the Talbooth Church, and there is enormous uncertainty as to where St. Giles used to be, where the Talbooth Church used to be, where Knox was buried. None of that is accessible to us at the present day. So Knox survives only in tradition, in history, and in his influence, and of course, in his own writings. Well, he's remembered today for three things, I might say, for the wrong reasons. I want to itemize three of the reasons for which Knox is often remembered today. He is remembered, first of all, and perhaps most notoriously, for his most famous book, his first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women. Now, in this feminist age, of course, the title is a godsend to all kinds of extremists. We should bear in mind that this book, the title of the book, Regiment, has somehow changed its meaning since the date of publication. Knox's concern was not with women seen as a strident regiment marching against the males of the species. It wasn't women seen as some kind of jackbooted army or some kind of Amazons on the march. The word regiment here means the same as our modern word regime. And Knox's concern was not to derogate or degrade women but to argue against one simple fact, women as heads of government and women as heads of state. Knox, we know, had very close relations with a very large number of women who were his correspondents. This was true also, of course, of Samuel Rutherford, and it's a notable fact in the psychology of both of those men. And some of Knox's most important works, like his exposition of the Sixth Psalm, for example, consist of letters written to his mother-in-law, Mrs. Bowles. And there were others, too, who were his correspondents, and with whom he had very courteous pastoral relations, and with whom he was totally at ease. But remember the context of Knox's blast. It was written in 1558, and it reflected Knox's bitter experience of two women, both of them heads of state, who had caused the Reformation tremendous pain and had harassed many of Knox's old friends and understood Knox's purposes. One of those was Mary of Guise and Mary of Lorraine, who was the regent in Scotland due to the minority of her daughter Mary, who became later Mary Queen of Scots. Now, when Knox wrote his first blast, Mary was still in France. She came to Scotland only in 1561. And Mary Queen of Scots was not Knox's target when he wrote this first blast. His targets were, first of all, Mary of Guise, Queen Mary's mother, and even more important, Queen Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary, who was at that time ruling in England, from which Knox had had to flee. Now, Mary, of course, launched in her brief reign a very, very bitter persecution against the Protestants. She was married, as you know, to Philip of Spain, and she was determined to exploit that Catholic power's resources to extirpate Protestantism in her own kingdom, south of the border. And many of Knox's own friends had perished 
at the hands of Bloody Mary. Now, it was in that context where he saw the Reformation itself hindered by those female heads of state. Two women, Mary of Guise, an extremely able and astute woman, not as cruel as Mary Tudor, but in many ways just as effective in the Presbyterian Reformation. At South the Border, the quite vicious and bigoted Mary Tudor, a saint in her own way in private life, but brutal in her public policy. It was she who lit those dreadful fires in Smithfield where Cranmer, Latimer, Ridley and many others had perished in the flames. And Knox looked at the position and his conclusion was not simply that these women were abusing their power in this vicious way, but he argued that the whole idea of women in power, in supreme power in a sense of state, was wrong. That the regime or the rule of women, that this was wrong. Now, Knox wasn't arguing simply against women's ordination to office in the Christian church. He was arguing against women in government, women heads of state, women bosses in all shapes, in all forms, at all levels of society. They should not rule in the home, they should not rule in the church, and they should not rule in the state. Now, Knox argued that thesis through his first blast in a, a very logical way. He argued that the regime, the rule of women, was against nature, it was against scripture, and it was subversive of good order. As I said, he was being extremely consistent, and I think that those of us who pull out those Pauline texts about women not having authority and apply them in a church context and in that church context only should realize that, taken literally, their range is much wider than that and that they forbid women in authority in every sphere of human life. Now, I myself don't have great problems or any problems with women in seniority or in government, frankly, in any of those spheres, and it would not trouble me greatly if we were given more place in the Church, either because of the fundamental Paul and principle in Christ that is neither male nor female. But it is an extraordinary thing that many of those right-wing Christians who would be Knox's foremost admirers would also have been committed Thatcherites in their political allegiances. And Knox would have been absolutely horrified at the thought of a woman exercising any such power. That's what the blast is against. Now, as I said, I don't have a problem with women in authority, in commerce, professions, industry, whatever. I don't share Knox's views or his use of those texts, as it happens. Knox intended the blast to be a first blast, but women were spared the second and third blasts by the march of events, as it happens. But there is no doubt that Knox paid a high price for this first blast does not pay to blow your trumpet in this way against women. He said himself that it cost him all his friends in England. It cost him above all, and this was something of great consequence, the sympathy and support of Mary Tudor's sister Elizabeth. Knox prophesied, and I think that's the right word, that the said Mary would not long outlive the publication of his first blast. And she died, I think, three months afterwards. And Elizabeth, her sister, took her place. But Elizabeth too had read the blast, and she was not impressed. And she held that blast against Knox for the rest of his life. 
And very often, her help could have been decisive in the reformation cause in Scotland, but it was not given. And that was largely because of special reasons that derived from Elizabeth's view of this first blast. It's also interesting that John Calvin was very not impressed. Calvin dedicated one of his commentaries to Elizabeth of England, and Elizabeth said no thanks. And she said no thanks because she identified Calvin with Knox's position. And Calvin was both to write to the English foreign minister, or his then equivalent, and say, I didn't even know this book was being published. And had I known, I would have said, don't publish it. Because, he said, I would accept that sometimes in history, or for the reign of women, it's not the divine norm, Calvin said. It may occasionally be God's will in a particular situation. And in any case, Calvin was far too much a politician and diplomat to unnecessarily outrage the head of state. And Bisa and Bullinger and others were also embarrassed. Now it's important because it indicates to you that the reformers, you see, were not necessarily agreed in all these details. They had their own inner tensions between them. You have in Knox embarrassing all his friends by publishing this book. And Calvin, Bisa and Bullinger all distanced themselves from it as best they could. But the damage was done. And it was serious damage, in fact, diplomatically to the reform cause. Knox is also remembered because of the vandalism that was perpetrated by his followers, particularly in the struggles of 1560. Now, these are always dragged up. The way that churches in Perth and monasteries at Schoon and Dunbar and elsewhere were all vandalized, destroyed, damaged, precious books and manuscripts were burnt. And of course, the whole was driven by the passion of the times against idols of all kinds. And there is no doubt that sometimes there was serious damage done. And there is no doubt that sometimes what we might call priceless artifacts from our past were destroyed in the fury of the mob. It does not seem to be fair, nevertheless, to blame John Knox for this. And I think we ought to remind ourselves of a very simple fact. There have always been mobs in Scotland. And there are still mobs in Scotland. And the spirit we see to say today, for example, at a range or Celtic football match, that same mentality was as prevalent in Knox's day as it is in our day. And it makes no more sense to blame John Knox for those so-called Protestant mobs than it does to blame me for the actions of Rangers football supporters. Now, part of our difficulty here is that every age thinks that there were never mobs before, never yobs. There were no teenagers in my day. That's the old story. And we all imagine that in those days, so the 16th and 17th centuries, there was tremendous law and order and decency and cleanliness and morality and everything was beautiful compared to the rough times and climes of the present day. Now the reverse is the case. There were far more incidents of mob violence. There were far more yobs in 16th century Edinburgh than there are in 21st century Edinburgh. In fact, just before Mary arrived in Scotland in 1561, Edinburgh's tradesmen had a spectacular riot, which had no connection at all with John Knox. One of their comrades was about to be executed or hanged in Edinburgh, 
And the tradesmen, the craftsmen, the whoever they were, joiners, clockmakers, butchers, bakers, tailors, shoemakers, they just went on the rampage. And they pulled down the gallows, they stormed the prison, they took the bailiffs and the provost hostage, and they exacted a promise from the local authorities that there be no execution and they themselves would have indemnity. And the whole city was looted and torn apart, and it had no link whatever uh, with John Knox or the Reformation. Now, you may think that in England, of course, things were very different. And uh, we may think that England is Oxbridge, it's Oxbridge now, it was Oxbridge then, but it was not. I read last week a book by Christopher Hill on the world turned upside down. And it is a fascinating discussion and analysis of English society in the 1640s, around the time of Oliver Cromwell and the Westminster Assembly. And English society then was in a state of chaos. And you may think, but they all went to church, didn't they? And that is so far from the truth. Hardly any of them went to church. And there was a tremendous anti-clericalism directed especially against the clergy of the Church of England. And there were there was all there were all kinds of occult practices, all kinds of blasphemous activities, and among the sectaries, the familists and the fifth monarchy men and the levelers and the diggers and all these people, there was a tremendous contempt for organized religion. And it was so bad, in fact, that sometimes they would fill the, the pulpits with, with straw and uh, they would bring along their horses and their pigs who would baptize the pigs in the churches in Puritan England. The whole picture we have of a gloriously ordered world before our own 21st century is completely askew. And these vandals, I'm sure, these were no more Protestant, reformed, Christian people than the mobs and yobs you see at football matches in Scotland today. And I think it is totally unfair to blame Knox for incidents of that kind. And Knox is also remembered today for his attitude towards and his treatment of poor little Queen Mary, Mary Queen of Scots. Now, of course, they had some marvellous meetings and they had altercations which are recorded vividly in Knox's own account of the Reformation in Scotland. Incidentally, Knox's very extensive two volume work on the Reformation is a classic of English prose, a bridge between Scots and English, and, and it is so readable. It is really an enormously uh, graphic and dynamic document, and it recounts his encounters with, with the young queen. Now, everybody thinks, you see, you go to the new college or St. Giles and you see this statue or this huge grim-faced man looks like a free church minister. He's standing there, he's 12 feet tall uh, because he's on a huge plinth and he's, he's, he's got a, a long, lean, mean face and this enormous, long, thin nose and a beard and he looks emaciated and fierce and you say, you will let him be too a dark night and you think of this poor queen, Queen Mary when Queen Mary came to Scotland, she was age 19. She had been brought up at the French court. She had had a lifetime of training in diplomacy. She was an extremely able woman. She was intelligent. She was well read. She was a negotiator. She was tough. She was determined, she was articulate, she'd have been a match for any man in this audience tonight. And she wasn't little. Knox was little. 
as most Scotsmen were, maybe not even five feet tall. Mary was the Princess Diana of her day. She was enormously tall. And she looked down on this wee man, who had never been trained in the arts of diplomacy, intrigue, or negotiation. And a man who also knew that if events, if things went just a little bit wrong, he would end up on the gallows or on the execution block. Of course, as it happened, it was Mary herself whose life ended tragically on the execution block. And maybe we should be thankful that it was an Anglican moderate, not a Presbyterian bigot, who is to blame for that execution. It was Elizabeth and her via media, her middle way, who sent Queen Mary to her death. Thank God it wasn't John Knox. Or what would they be saying? But as it happens, we have to remind ourselves that in the dynamics of the conversation between these two people, Queen Mary and Knox, Knox was at an enormous disadvantage. And he was in no position. He was not in a pulpit above contradiction. He met Mary on her terms, on her ground, and he was dealing with one of the most formidable personalities in history, one who still fascinates after over 400 years. She can still be witch, and she still charms. Now, I have no animus against me. I think that Queen Mary was, in many ways, more sinned against than sin. But she was no saint, and she was no child, and she was no fool, and she was no weakling, and she was no dwarf. She was none of these things. She was, if ever a woman was, she was formidable. And took a lot of courage for Knox to stand up to her. Of course, part of her formidableness was that she could cry and she could shed tears, which Knox wasn't allowed to do. And it takes uh, a certain kind of courage to maintain your deformed convictions in the face of the tears of a six foot tall beautiful queen. But Knox did that. Well, what was he then? He's remembered for the wrong reasons, I think, for these three weeks which I've suggested. He was, first and foremost, altogether, to begin with and finally, he was a reformer. Without Knox, there would have been a reformation, but not the reformation that we had. It would have happened, I'm sure, much later, in a much more moderate and milder form. It was due to Knox that it took the course that it did and developed the character that it did develop, the Reformed Church in Scotland. Let's get the context here. Remember that we're talking the 16th century. Luther had uh, lit the torch of the Reformation in 1517. He was dead before, of course, Knox came to Scotland. Calvin died that same year in 1560. So Knox is set firmly in the generation of first reformers. He is roughly overlapping with Luther and with Calvin belongs to that great generation of primal reformers. What did he bring to his work and career as a reformer? Well, he brought many qualities. He brought, first of all, a wide, painful experience. Remember that he was the helper of George Wishart, the martyr who was burned in St. Andrews. Knox was his bodyguard, which again speaks volumes for this little man's courage. And uh, when Wishart went to his death, of course, Knox wanted to follow him. But uh, Wishart said to him, No, my son, 
one is enough for a sacrifice. And Knox was sent back. He ended up, of course, in St. Andrew's Castle, as you know. He was there, I think, when Cardinal Beaton was murdered. And, of course, as a consequence, he was taken prisoner and he spent two years day and night to the boat in all kinds of weather, too hot, too cold. Knox never lost his hope or his courage during those two, two dreadful years. There was one night when they were sailing along the five coast and they saw in the distance the lights of the Nandros and the towers of the University College. And one of Knox's companions said to him, Do you know that place? Yes, he said. I can see those towers when I first opened my mouth to the glory of God. And I am assured that one day I'll open my mouth again in that same place to the glory of God. And so it was, but not for many years. After the galleys, Knox spent some time in England, and that too had a great influence upon his development. He was appointed one of the royal chaplains, was involved in the vice of the prayer book, was offered a bishopric, which he declined. But they were formative years for him. He was a highly esteemed preacher and uh, church leader during those years. But then came Mary Tudor and Knox and many others fled to the continent. And uh, many of them fled to the German town of uh, Frankfurt and uh, Knox eventually landed there uh, among the English exiles and ministered to them. You may imagine that only where there are Presbyterians to men of the missions, but uh, here in Frankfurt the Anglicans also divided, and they divided over the liturgy, and the division was so bitter that Knox had to leave Frankfurt, and he went then to Geneva. And in Geneva, he was an acquaintance of John Calvin and was filled with admiration for the city of Geneva and its polity, both civil and enthusiastic. And thought it was the most perfect society that had ever been seen on earth. And then uh, eventually he made his way home to Scotland, enriched by those varied experiences, following Wishart the galley slave years, the years in Frankfurt, the years in Geneva at the heart of the reform cause. And he was no mere provincial for the time of his return to his own native land uh, late in 1559. And Knox was also, of course, a great preacher. It is difficult for us to assess in, in that area directly because it is a remarkable providence that none of Knox's sermons survives. I suspect because he had no notes and didn't write anything anyway that he intended to speak in public. We have letters, we have treatises, but we have no sermons. There are several intriguing things about Knox the preacher. First of all, there is the way he was called to be a preacher. He was a most reluctant preacher. And he, in fact, himself never volunteered for this calling in the first place. There is some probability that Knox, in fact, was an ordained Catholic priest. I, I can't vouch for that, but it's a probability. But he did not want to be a preacher. It was during his time at St. Andrews in the castle that he began to expound John's Gospel in the University Chapel, mainly for the benefit of the two sons of a nobleman to be served as tutor. 
And as he lectured, that is the old Scottish word for expounding a chapter verse by verse, he was overheard by some of the congregation and also by some of its leaders. And they made up their minds that they would make John Knox a preacher themselves. They would call it to the ministry. And there is an interesting principle here, if you forgive me on it. The churches today operate very largely by calling for volunteers, and folk are expected to volunteer for this, that, and the other. And if you don't volunteer, you're deemed to be lacking in zeal. Now, John Knox never had the self-belief to prompt him to offer the services as a preacher. And had it been left to him, he would never have become a preacher. I told them in Burness Street Church conference story of the West Indian fast forward Curtie Ambrose. It may seem a bit incongruous, but I, I happen to like Curtie Ambrose since I'm not in the receiving end of like the Madadell deliveries. Curtie is a seven foot tall West Indian fast bowler. And one day his captain said to him, his captain on the New Testament said to me curtly, would you like to bowl from the nursery end? And Kirkley said nothing. And then his captain, after he, another little period, came and said to him again, Kirkley, would you like to bowl from the nursery end? And still Kirkley said nothing. And a third time the captain of the Richards came and said, Kirkley, would you like to bowl from the nursery end? Look, skipper, he said. If you tell me to bowl, I'll bowl. If you ask me, do I want to bowl, I don't want to bowl. But if you tell me to bowl, I'll bowl. And sometimes that's how it is in the church. That's what happened to Knox. He never volunteered. The preacher in the castle of John Ruff, one at one service, preached on the call to the ministry. And at the close of it, he turned to Knox and he said to him something like this, Master John, we are a church of Christ, a small church, but it belongs to us as a church of Christ to call men to be preachers and ministers. And we are calling you to be God's mouth to speak for his glory. And Ruff made plain that if Knox did not heed the call, a divine malediction might well rest upon him. Something very similar happened to John Calvin, who never wanted to go to Geneva, but went only because his older contemporary Pharaoh threatened him with a divine curse. It's remarkable that both of those men, you see, they held back, just as Jeremiah held back from the work. When Knox was given this charge by John Ruff, he disappeared. And for two or three days he wasn't seen, because he was so afraid, his heart was so heavy, he couldn't speak, he said, he tells the story himself about himself in the third person. There was no mirth on the face of the said John for three days because the burden lay so heavily upon him. He began to preach, and of course he preached with tremendous vehemence. And the English ambassador, Rando, wrote to his boss in London, Lord Cecil, in 1561. And he said to him, the voice of one man, he said, John Knox, can put more life in us than 500 trumpets blasting simultaneously in our ears. There was tremendous vivifying force, inspirational force in Knox's preaching. And Knox never lost that. You all know the story the account given was preaching 
by Andrew Melville Smith to James Melville, who was a young man in St Andrews heard Knox preach, and said that he began quietly, but he ended up ding the pooper into plants. He was stumping it away with all his energy. The remarkable thing about that story, often told out of context, is that it belongs to the last few weeks of Knox's life. After Knox had had a stroke, and when he was a dying man, and Melville points the most amazing picture of this decrepit 58-year-old man being led into the church, dressed in a long coat keep him warm with a great big fur collar, and he is led up to the pulpit. He leans in one hand. He holds a stick on which he leans. And in Melville's picturesque language, his faithful servant Robert Ballantyne takes his other oxter and knocks his leg into the pulpit. And he steadies himself. And I can hardly hear the word that he says because he's so weak. He can scarcely stand. And yet, as he warms to his feet, this man who's had a stroke, who's dying, who's frail and decrepit, he is soon so alive, he is thumping the poop. Now, I don't anymore recommend thumping poops because there's no connection between vehemence, especially artificial vehemence, and spiritual power. But the, the passion was there, you see. The, the, the belief in the message, the belief in the importance of the message, and this message itself set the man on fire. And it was those unrecorded and perhaps unprepared servants of, of, the, of Knox's that drove the Reformation and enthused the congregation of the Lord in Scotland. Knox was also a theologian, and I can't say enough for about that, but it would be quite wrong to dismiss Knox as an unscholarly firebrand. He was a well-educated man, trained under the last great Scottish medieval scholar, John Major in St Andrews. And he was a voluminous writer. Despite his not having much leisure, he has left behind him six massive volumes of readable and relevant theological writing. Now, I'm not going to go to that in detail at all, you'll be glad to know. There is a 400-page treatise on predestination among those, and it is very similar to Calvin's, admittedly, to Calvin's position, but it is a very corporate job, especially for such a busy man. There is a very fine treatise on prayer that will still edify anyone who read it. In that treatise, Knox argues, if there can be a fire without heat and a lamp without light, then there may be faith without fervent prayer. And that, I guess, is where Knox himself spent much of his invisible time. He had faith and he was given to fervent prayer. There is also an exposition, as I said, of the Lord's Prayer, and there are countless letters that deal with theological topics and themes. There is also the remarkable Scots Confession, which was finalised in 1560 and became the uh, manifesto of the Scottish Reformation. It is a remarkable document which would merit a lecture in its own right, it is a very mature theological statement on behalf of the Scottish Reformed Church, and it was written by John Knox and five other men, all of them named John, in four days. The, the, the current Westminster Confession of Faith took five years, in one sense, to prepare, whereas the Scots Confession took only four days. Now, in some respects, it shows, but 
There is a tremendous force and simplicity in this old Scots confession. And it is especially important in the connection with the doctrine of the Church because Knox's main thinking was on what is a true Church and how can you tell what a true Church is. John Calvin had said the true Church has two marks, the preaching of the Word and the sacraments. The Scots Confession added a third, the preaching of the Word, the sacraments, and discipline. And that is in many ways a distinctive Noxian input and a very important element in Scottish ideas as to what a church actually is. I would make a, a just a, a, a sort of qualification there that to Knox this would not mean what we call church censure, study for God for all. It was discipline in a sense of an adequate organization and polity. The church must be organized for its own mission. And that brings me to my fourth comment on Knox's qualities as a reformer. He was a great organizer. A great organizer. And that was seen above all in what's called the first book of discipline. And that is one of the great documents of Scottish history. It is a very comprehensive outline of a total organization for a Christian church. It deals with such things as the election of ministers, the calling of a minister, the maintenance of ministers, their discipline. It uh, talks about not only ministers, but also about readers about exhorters and about superintendents. How would today's Presbyterians lie to a superintendent? You, know, you may think they're only bishops, but John Knox had them. And I think they have enormous mileage. These superintendents were mainly preachers. They were itinerants over areas which were left without pastors and they were subject to the constant review of the presbytery. And I think that in many areas, particularly in rural Scotland, when there are no, no preachers, they would perform a very valuable function. But this book, of course, also gave Knox suspicion in other areas. For example, it was here that Knox spoke of the need for a school in every parish and a university in every town. And where he spoke of the importance of the nobility educating their sons in letters, not in military arts, but in letters, of course, at their own expense. But he also spoke of this, that the children of the poor who showed any aptitude for learning should be educated to the highest level at the charge of the church itself. The mad vision lay dormant for many, many years. In some respects, it has not been fulfilled yet. The poor are still handicapped as far as higher education goes. And that was not Knox's vision. Knox was also concerned for a stated provision for the poor. He said, it is damnable that the poor for whom God cares should be so systematically neglected and he laid it as a charge upon every church, every congregation, that there be deacons whose specific function was the care and relief of the poor. And that too lay dormant for many years. Knox's schemes, in fact, all lay dormant for a very simple reason. And I want to, to share this with you. And I have always and become myself quite vehement of the matter. It is a monstrous injustice that John Knox's pilloried, while Scotland's aristocracy are lauded and applauded. At the Reformation, 
Knox's plan was that the enormous wealth of the medieval church, a wealth consisting very to a large extent of land ownership, lands bequeathed to the pious over many centuries were in the church's possession. And Knox wanted these lands to be dedicated to those great objectives to maintain the ministry, to build a school in every parish, a university in every town, to educate the children of the poor and to provide for all the nation's poor. That was Knox's vision. But the nobles, the lords and the barons, they had their eyes on the land. And they took the land and they kept the land and not one acre of it did they ever get, give back. The land to the medieval church fell into the hands of the progenitors of Scotland's great families of the present day. They showed incredible rapacity and greed. And for a whole century after the Reformation, the church was bankrupt, impoverished. Ministers, this seems incredible. Reformed ministers were reduced to keeping public houses to earn a living for themselves, while the great families of Scotland enriched themselves with the lands of the churches. And that's why the Book of Discipline was never given parliamentary sanction in Scotland because it laid down that the lands of the medieval church be handed over to the continuing reformed church for purposes that Knox had stated. Now I thought I had nothing to say, but I've run out of time. I want to say last of all that Knox was a revolutionary and this again might be near to troubled waters because many Christians have argued simply and they did this in Knox's day as well the powers that be are ordained by God and we must be subject to those powers that be now Knox was of no such mind and had he been there had been no reformation Knox was of the view that in some situations it was justifiable to engage in what is called civil disobedience. During the whole sad years of apartheid in South Africa, the Reformed churches forgot this great doctrine and they gave their support by silence and sometimes in more practical ways to programs of oppression and suppression. Knox said, as a matter who the king or the queen is, if that king or queen forbids the administration of gospel ordinances, forbids preaching, forbids the sacraments, then the church is bound to defy any such government order. Knox said, if the church persecutes my Christian brothers and sisters, and hounds them to death, I am bound to resist that government. Knox said, if government policies subvert the common weal, the well-being of the commonwealth, then the commonwealth may resist that government. Knox said, you must not engage rebellion lightly, willfully, or for personal ends, or for your own advancement, but for those reasons you may. It is a precious, precious doctrine without which would have been no modern democracy. Knox was not its inventor. It could be found also in the medieval theologians. It was a doctrine which frankly made our Scottish Victorian churchmen shape and shiver like nothing you ever saw. 
Thomas Chalmers, even William Cunningham, trembled on these Noxian ideas. But you know, they were a very important part, and are still, of our Scottish heritage. The George Buchanan, on the right of the kings among the Scots, that was a subversion document in the Noxian tradition. So was Rutherford's Lex Rex, the law of his king, which argued that uh, kings reigned not by divine right, but by popular appointment. That was revolution for you in 1630. And in the 1650s and 60s, Alexander Shields, the Covenanters, were uh, devoting hundreds of pages to the idea uh, that it was right for us to resist tyrants. And that is part of your genetic inheritance, theologically. You are the heirs of people who respected government as a divine appointment, but who would not stand idly by when government became ungodly. In one of his famous altercations with Mary Queen of Scots, they discussed this subject at great length, for the subjects could resist their monarchs. But Knox was adamant to Mary's horror that they could. And he said to Mary, suppose you, madam, that if a father falls into a frenzy and turns upon his children, they may not resist him. Likewise, madam, if a king or a queen turn upon his children and turn upon the commonwealth and turn upon the kirk of God, think you we should stand idly by? But of course the answer was not. And that's why we had the English Civil War. And that's why we had the covenanting struggle with all its unspeakable horrors. That's why by 1688 we had in this country, in advance of any other in Europe, we had constitutional monarchy, we had limited monarchy, we had an infinite democracy. Because those reform doctrines that made men bold before God ought to make them bold before men. Well, I better leave it there. There's a, a marvelous document here that speaks of the last days of John Knox. It's a very moving document, and maybe I can quote just one or two passages from that as he comes into the very last day of his life. A little afternoon, he calls his wife to read the 15th chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthians on the resurrection. Knox was very, very interested in the resurrection. It's a constant topic in his thought and preaching. And he said to her, it's not that a comfortable chapter. A little after he says, and now for the last, I commend my soul, spirit and body, pointing upon his three fingers, unto thy hands, O Lord. Thereafter, about five hours, he says to his wife, these are famous words, Go read where I cast my first anchor. And so she read the 17th of John's Evangel, John's Gospel, which being ended, was read some of Calvin's sermons upon the Ephesians. We, thinking that he was asleep, asked if he heard, answered, I hear and understand far better, praise God. And just one thing more, the night before, Dr. Preston, about nine o'clock in the evening, demanded and asked him how he did, he said, the background to this is interesting because after his death there was a Catholic slander that Knox was virtually insane on his deathbed. 
and that he died in, in a horror of doubt and unbelief. And this is an account written by his servant John Ballantyne, who led into the pulpit in that incident I prayed to him from, from James Melville. Knox said, I have been tempted by Satan, but when he saw that he could not prevail, he tempted me to trust in myself, or to have rejoiced or boasted of myself. But I repulsed him with a sentence, and he quotes the Latin, What have you that you have not received? And it was really with these sentiments that Knox died. I'll just remind you of one other remarkable fact, which again shows the spirit of a man. Upon Friday, he commanded Richard, that was a servant, to go make his kiss, wherein he was born to his body. There was no fear there. He told the servant, go and make my coffin. It was made in the house itself, and in that coffin was buried. And at his funeral at his graveside, Regent Morton, appointed just the day before, made his famous comment as an older coffin. There, he said, was a man who neither feared nor flattered any flesh. Well, I'm 